Good afternoon, Mike Winkler here, and I wanted to take a minute and I wanted to talk about um, a couple of conceptual things. I wanted to take a step backwards. Someone had made the point to me the other day of there is no actual definition of SIM, right? Security Event or Information Manager. We can't even seem to get a consensus on how it's pronounced, right? I hear SIM from time to time, but you know, everyone likes what they like. Um, but it turned into a question of, well, what are we actually trying to accomplish and why does someone want a SIM and, you know, what is the idea of a security ecosystem? So I decided to take a few minutes and talk about what the plan is here at IBM and what we hope you're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to bring to you, right? So I just asked the question, what do we mean by security intelligence? There is data. There is always data. There is thousands of logs in your firewall and millions in your active directory. And a lot of this is data that doesn't actually help. Hey, Jerry logged in at 8 o'clock in the morning for the 85th straight day. He missed a day before that and then another 21 days. Um, it doesn't actually do anything, but it's data that allows you to build information, right? To say, what is a normal pattern and what is, um, where do our users log in from and what do things look like? Information hopefully can allow you to build intelligence to say, I know who the users are who log in and I know the sites we tend to hit and I know what the web services used by my team are. So looking at the data, I can see what's normal, what's abnormal. I can form information. From information, I can allow you to make good decisions, right? Hopefully, we bring you business intelligence. But let me drill down a little bit and what we're trying to do with that. Um, first thing I went after when I was looking at the difference between data and information was these security devices. You have unfiltered log data, like I alluded to a few minutes ago. There's scads of it. Some of it requires an expert to read, and by itself, it doesn't mean anything, right? It, it's building blocks for something greater. But then you have particularly smart data, like your Blue Coat or your FireEye, Palo Alto, things like this, that will take a look at events going across a firewall or a proxy, and will say, we've noticed a pattern of data that we think is a denial of service or we think is a malware attack. And it's like, okay, all well and good. So what we want to do at uh, QRadar, and I guess this is one of the big points I wanted to make today, is we take that unfiltered data, which is good. It allows us to build information. We add it to the smart data that's coming from these other devices, right? So we're not discarding the conclusions your FireEye or your Blue Code or something else comes up with. We're taking that and we're adding it to the unfiltered data to kind of form the basis of our conclusion, right? We're taking other smart things and we're adding on to that, hopefully to come out with the best possible answer. I then went and looked at network devices, right? And you have a whole bunch of uh, specific information gathering devices, security devices uh, that gather network data. And, uh, you know, I've listed here uh, my QADAR network insights. Something's going to get all this uh, layer seven data for me and grab forensics off the wire and all of this good stuff. But then you have so much general network data from your routing and your switching infrastructure from AWS and from Azure, right? To say, it's like that unfiltered data from the firewall to say, here's a bunch of stuff. So I have specific data and then I have some very um, generalized data. And in the same way, we take the uh, unfiltered and the smart data. I have to take the specific and the generalized, add it to the intelligence model. Fair enough. Host-based data, it's, a, it's basically the same idea, but you have to worry about malware in a host, right? It's the places the end users touch recently. And there's a couple of really good anti-malware systems out there. I listed Semantic, but I could think of five or six good ones. Um, there is big fix for compliance and patching, right? Which is the IBM solution for that, but I know there's a few others. Compliance and patching data is vital. Okay, I mean, it's the basic hygiene of keeping your hosts in good shape to keep a bad thing from happening. And you need the intelligence from, am I being spiked by malware? Good question. Do, um, am I up to date on my patches? Are my configs as they should be? Are my users screwing around? It's important data, right? Um, and then there's OS logs, right? We're back to the kind of unfiltered, generalized data that we sometimes need to build upon these other data sets to build our best solution. Um, Vulnerability data. Those of you who read the things um, I'm working on, you'll see that I'm a big fan of vulnerability data, right? There is um, a whole bunch of industry standard vulnerability scanners. Uh, there's Rapid7 and Qualys and Nessus and a whole bunch of good stuff so that you can check your applications and your operating systems to make sure you're not particularly vulnerable to an attack. 
Now with QRadar, I'll take this vulnerability data, correlate it to the host data I have, and look at what's coming in through these other data channels I've spent the last few minutes talking about. And maybe Palo Alto says, hey, I've seen a pattern of behavior that is an advanced persistent threat, and I've had a ping from one of your workstations, and oh, by the way, Koala says that guy's vulnerable. I'm gonna give you in one screen, not just the, the Qualys data, which is cool, but I'm going to give you the data that says, hey, we looked at what came in across your Cisco devices, what came in across your enterprise firewall, and oh, by the way, we have something right now that is trying to exploit a vulnerability. This is super important, right? It takes us from the realm of the theoretical to what's going on right now. And um, on top of that, you have uh, things like AppScan, right? That almost everybody develops their own stuff to some extent. It might be they're just writing rules to an application. It might be their own mobile apps. It might be something that's customized when it's brought in the door for a vendor. And that you do need to look at your stuff at the code level, both before and after you build it, so that you're not introducing new vulnerabilities or, God forbid, exploits into your environment. So I can take a special purpose scanner like the app scan from my crew, and we can go through and we can say, hey, by the way, uh, yeah, there is a vulnerability in that code we wrote and we realized it last week and sorry about that. And we're working around to fixing it. And is something happening that's going to exploit that between the discovery time and the repair time? It gives you an awful lot of visibility in there so you don't ever have to have that moment of, oh, God, we've been hit for three months and we just realized when we got around to writing the patch, right? It's a really big deal, vulnerability data. Um, identity data, this is our up-and-comer, this is our big kid now, right? There's always Active Directory and that part's easy. And I take the Active Directory data, I correlate it against your firewall data, and I give you user behavioral analytics. And this is good. And it shows me if um, someone logged in in Helsinki and an hour later logged in in New York or logged in in New York while they're in Helsinki or, you know, things that are a lot more complicated than that. Like uh, someone who belongs in a given data center logs in during a time when they're not working or there's about 70 good examples, right? And those we do mostly with Active Directory and firewall data, but the year is 2017 and things move forward. I have an awful lot of smart firewalls and proxies that will give me user data back. And what if my user data coming across the firewall doesn't match my Active Directory data, right? So if I see Bob is um, not logged into his machine in AD, but I do see Bob is um, has activity in the firewall, this is a problem. It's not just identity data against events, it's identity data against other identity data, right? It becomes a bigger and bigger circumstance. And there's a whole mess of, including the stuff that my folks are doing with identity and access management, right? So you have single sign-on, you have federated ID to say that I only log in one place so that I can get to all of my disparate systems, I can get to my Salesforce, I can get to my soft layer accounts, whatever, from a single place. And the identity access accounts are just an extension of the same principle. If I have someone who's been penetrated in one place, right? Have they been penetrated everywhere? Do I have a user whose account's been compromised? They've gotten into the SSO and now um, I've got a pattern of behavior across a user's various identities. Single sign-on data added to my SIM, to my security intelligence model, is going to give you a lot, of a lot of ability to early identify when you have someone who's penetrated your environment. And last one, I promise, guys, is um, encryption and data level security, right? I mean, you can't get along without data level security in the modern era because the perimeter has gone. We don't even know where it is anymore. Um, there's great special purpose stuff like my team over at Trustee that does fraud protection, but there's lots of great individual special purpose software like my trustee that says, hey, is this how this should be used? And maybe you want to go in and say, hey, you know, this is a completely normal file set. And it's being accessed by users in a way different than we think it should. And it'll flag against the SIM model security event information management. We'll arrive at security intelligence to say, hey, that user was logged in and that should have been okay, but that's not how they should use data. Do I have a bad actor in my environment? Suddenly raises that question. I've got these things like encryption and God bless encryption. And I know that's a political hot button right now, but encryption is kind of the last line of defense and the thing you always have in place when anything else fails you.
And there's a dozen really good encryption vendors, including my folks that make Guardium, right? Which is all, all uh, you know, file and field level security, as well as encryption of those fields, kicks back up to my SIM model so I can say, hey, what have I got going in in QRadar? I've got this user data. I've got this vulnerability data, the host, and on and on. And if I see someone that's trying to move uh, things from inside one field to another parallel field, and they shouldn't be, if I've got a help desk guy that's doing stuff that a financial analyst should do, alert. If I have someone that's trying to access encrypted data, and they're not someone that should do that, alert. Now, maybe I got Vormetric in place, and I have an encrypted data volume. And, you know, Mary from accounting makes a legitimate mistake, tries to hit the wrong server. We get an alert and she says, oh, that's right. Sorry, I had the server name wrong. No harm, no foul. But it is much better to know that Mary made a legitimate error and you just cross that one off your list than not know if you got Bob who actually is trying to crack a volume, right? This way, it's better to know even if some of these are, oh, it's a false detect. Better to know than not know. Okay, so this is all that encryption and data level stuff, right? It's pretty serious. Um, last piece of that is DLP, and DLP is going to be a beast, right? Setting up DLP, even with the really good systems like the semantic and like the force point, it's going to take you some time to get this in place if you see data being used in a way it shouldn't. Now, and with my experience, DLP most of the time is users making reasonable mistakes. Right, someone that's trying to move data to their Gmail account because it's easier to print from there, or someone who didn't realize something had a watermark and wasn't supposed to be released for another six days. Mostly it's reasonable mistakes. Less than one in 10 or thereabouts is someone who's actually a bad actor trying to steal from the company. But when you get these uh, employees that are making reasonable wrong answers, you give them a call and you say, hey, you know, you were on the PDF you were sending out. That That's not released until next week. And they go, oh, crap, sorry about that. So that by adding things like this data level security, be it the encryption or the DLP, we're moving beyond the, hey, a bad thing is happening, and even beyond the kind of practice model of, hey, we're seeing an actual offense in your environment right now against an actual vulnerability. But we can tell you when people are making decisions that aren't the best possible so that you can counsel them. The value we're trying to get out of that, of course, is to prevent every possible exploit. We're never going to prevent them all. But if we can take all of this data and put it in one place for you and move beyond the, oh, by the way, someone's banging on your firewall trying to get in, and oh, by the way, there's a vulnerability where they're banging, hey, is that patched? Hey, who is that? But to actually get to the point of how do we get into the proactive curve of preventing the behavior that causes uh, security incidents, right? Data becomes information, becomes intelligence. And this is the plan over here at Q Radar. Okay, I want to kind of uh, take a minute and stop here to say this is the end of a thought, but I wanted to add one other thought onto the top, right? Data becomes information, becomes intelligence, and this is good, and this puts you in a good place for running your environment. But after that, sometimes you need intelligence to become action. Um, so I've got our friend QRadar that's gathered up all the things we talked about in the last few screens, and sometimes you need to do data forensics, incident response, investigation. So let's say I've got someone who's suddenly trying to move things in encrypted files they shouldn't be getting into or logging in at strange times of day or it's a question of did Mary not know what she was doing when she moved that file or was she intentionally doing it? So I take I2 and I look for non-obvious data relationships, right? So I take a look at someone's LinkedIn posts and run them back against the times where they're doing things in my environment they probably shouldn't have. I take a look at flight schedules and I attach that to, um, to login time data. So we can take all these non-obvious data relationships Add it to what we pull out of QRadar, so maybe Jim is logging in in Helsinki and four hours later logging in in New York, and it's like, oh, that was reasonable. Jim's just having a heck of a day. But you, you mine for these non-obvious data relationships, right? So the intelligence becomes action. And sometimes you need full life cycle management, right? Our folks over at Resilient. Now, this is when you take the people, the process and the technology, right? And this is a lot of technology and this is some good process 
and we get the people involved to say, okay, so um, I have a, a, a ticket that's been opened. Yep, okay, QRadar opens a ticket because I see what looks like a vulnerability. Okay, fair enough. Is there any data going on that's going to exploit that vulnerability? Good question. Are there any users that are involved in this exploit? Good question. Is there a behavior attached to these users or these events? And all of this gets pushed down into Resilient, which knows your plan and knows your environment so that we can give you a full closed lifecycle remediation management so that when you go from your Q radar, which is giving you smart answers, you can then act to protect your environment. I know this was a lot of things to throw in in about 10 minutes of video, but I am Mike Winkler and this is what we mean by security intelligence.